week by uh, Darren, uh, one of the Game House's writers, and Mallory, another one of the Game House's writers, a shocker, two Game House writers. And my name is Connor, uh, I'm also a Game House writer, so that makes three of us really exciting stuff. Um, so we're here, we just came, we're coming off of an, an incredible Stage 3 playoffs weekend. Um, we cracked this one up to be just an incredible weekend of Overwatch, and it absolutely lived up to the expectations. We're going to break down all that action, so we're going to go through the scores, your player of the weekend, brought to you by an unknown sponsorship to be announced. Get excited for that one. All these sponsors rolling in for us, you know, we got to pick one of them. Um, then we're going to talk about the little thing that Achilleo said the uh, on the Watchpoint Stage 4 pre-show on Thursday, he said the... The, the desk would have something up their sleeves, and it was going to be very important to watch. We're going to talk about what we think that would be and what teams might serve to benefit from it the most. So it's going to be a great show. We've got a lot of good stuff to go through. Before we get to that, we have to do what we always do on this show. We have to reset our watch. Uh, it's just the usual thing. We catch you up with what we've been up to in our lives. We plug our writing if we have any specific pieces we're super proud of recently. All that good stuff. Uh, Darren? I'm gonna let you start us off. I think this is your first time on the recap show, right? So, uh, it's uh, yeah, Welcome. it's my first time. I did a I did a pre yeah. preview one time. Uh, so, uh, I've just been you know grinding the ladder. Uh, I've got a piece coming out this week on Battle for the Grid. It's a Power Rangers fighting game. It's a three v three. It's made by Enwy oh, Games. Wow. Uh, it came out earlier in the year and it had some rocky start, but they just announced crossplay for Xbox One and we and um I said we Xbox One and mm. Switch. Uh, with PC coming later this year or early next year. So I'm going to do a little uh, primer for people that don't know what it is. But if you were a fan of like the Marvel vs. Capcom series or any of those kind of quote-unquote anime fighters, that's definitely something to look at. Nice. And outside of that, just, you know, having my mind blown Man. by this uh, stage playoffs. It was beautiful and incredible. I'm excited to read that piece, though. It'll be cool. Uh, Mallory, what about you? What have you been, what have you been doing? Um, I've been working a lot at my other nice. job. So I have been mysteriously MIA from the internet. But I came back, like, literally last night. I got to write about the dragons. Um, spoiler alert, they won. Oh. Um, and I'm doing something really cool tonight in, like, three hours that you can probably read about next week. Big time. Ooh, eye emojis. Eye emojis in the chat for that one. Okay, Ikelios Jr., yeah, I see Yeah, something you. up her sleeve here. Interesting. <laughs> Well, uh, I haven't been up to anything super interesting. Nothing I emoji is Mallory over here. Um, but I did go to San Antonio over the weekend. Uh, my wife, Crystal, was at a, had a nursing conference, like a real professional kind of thing. So I went to, no joke, I think like six different coffee shops over the course of the weekend just to write. And it was actually incredible. Because like San Antonio, not going to crap on the city or anything, but there just wasn't a ton to do. Like I, we walked by the Alamo at night and it was kind of like, there it is. Like never forget and that was really it. Uh, we had a lot of queso in between the coffee shop stops, so that was good. Felt like crap the whole time. Uh, that's okay. And, uh, yeah, I've been writing more, um, just about Overwatch and just kind of generally covering stuff. No, like, super long feature pieces recently. Um, I have been covering TFT as well, uh, Team Fight Tactics. It's the auto chess from League of Legends. Uh, I'm it, they're, It's going to turn into an eSport uh, at some point, or at least have a lot of tournaments around it, so... I'm just trying to kind of get on the front end of understanding that game and covering it a little bit more. So that's been a lot of fun. But uh, we have to focus on the matter at hand here. This isn't a League of Legends or Teamfight Tactics show. This is about Overwatch. So to get kind of into the, the flow of things here, we're just going to walk through the scores of the Stage 3 playoffs. Um, again, Stage 3 playoffs going to be the end of Stage 3. Uh, top 8 teams going through bracket style, uh, quarter, semis, and finals. And we just crowned a winner, and it was incredible. It was an electric uh, thing. So we're going to go through it. Uh, I think, Mal, you're going to take us to the quarterfinals, and then we'll go from there. Yeah, buddy. Well, so the game started on Thursday night, and these were the games that were first to th I believe. Yeah. Um, so it was a series of five, ideally. Mm -hmm. um, the first one was Houston, Vancouver, and Vancouver won uh, a 3-0. They swept them pretty decisively, yeah. so... Sorry, Houston, that your impressive run got stopped yeah. immediately. I know what that's like. Um, then Shanghai wa, uh, faced New York, and they won 3-1. to one. So, you know, New York it does this it again. This is a trend, folks. <laughs> the international sign for choking has arrived. 
Uh, on Friday, uh, it was Soul versus The Shock. Unsurprisingly, The Shock won 3 1. Pretty cut and paste. The real surprise, I think, for a lot of people came Friday night when the Valiant played the Spark. Yeah. And the Valiant won 3 to 2 in a match 5 what series. A, and a lot a of match. people, including myself, I had my clown nose on, had the Spark to win the whole thing. <laughs> and then they lost in the first round. So if I jinxed them, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to do that. Yeah, and then moving on to the semis Saturday, you know, the hits kept on rolling, and these teams were showing us that the Clown Fiesta was just in full force. <laughs> Shanghai Dragons come out of nowhere against the Vancouver Titans and uh, dominate them in a 4-1. Yeah. A 4-1 that shook the house. No one knew what was going on. And they even had a little something to say about the about the San Francisco, San Francisco Shock as they were taking the stage. That said, San Francisco took on LA Valiant immediately after that and just clowned on them 4-0. Yeah, and this uh, all leading up to this crazy finals, uh, with the Shanghai has now taken down New York and Vancouver, two absolute powerhouse teams, two of the teams that we've talked about all season long as being a top team, and now they have to play the Shock, a team that we've also talked. I mean, those are the top three teams we've talked about all season long. Hangzhou maybe being a fourth, uh, and they come in and it's an incredible series. They go up, I think it's three one uh, or three zero. And then San Francisco starts the reverse sweep, brings it to 3-3, and the Shanghai Dragons win the seventh map. Uh, in unbelievably glorious fashion, uh, the team that, well, the the, the uh, franchise that went 0-40 in Season 1, a very different team than that team. But this new team has come in and looked absolutely unstoppable. And it was an unbelievable finals. It just it, This whole playoffs, this whole playoff run by Shanghai was just incredible. Um, which leads us to, we, ha- we have to crown our watch house Player of the Week, brought to you by uh, Mallory. What is this week's Watch House Player of the Week sponsored by? Brought to you by Pharmacy Airlines. Play nice, play fair. Pharmacy Airlines. Play nice, <laughs> play fair. Wow. That was really good for impromptu, first of all. Last week I said peaches, just in general. The there you fruit. go. Shout out to it. Yeah, like yeah, that's, that's so. Uh, we just had it sponsored by Peaches. All the Peaches in the world. James and the Giant Peach. So, Mallory, you have done much better for the sponsorship segment. Um, because we act, we're not going to bring this a little differently this week. Uh, there are so many good candidates, even outside of the Shanghai players, for the Player of the Week. So, we're each going to crown our own. We just couldn't decide on one. Is honestly what this is the culmination of. It's a tough decision. Um, Darren, I'm going to let you start us off. Who is your uh, Watch House? Player of the Week brought to you by Farmers Airlines. Play nice, play fair. So, I'm not gonna. I don't want to betray my Shanghai fans because I am a diehard Shanghai Dragons fan. All right, look through my social media history, you'll see how much I love them. But I think that there needs to be something said about Rascal and his ability to more or less take over the postseason by being the only support to play uh, Baptiste. I was checking it out on Omnic Meta, and he's got. I think the highest person after him has like 27 minutes yeah. total for the entire season. So for him to put in 156 hours on Baptiste and just make the immortality field and that kit look like something that you can't deal with, that to me just you have to you have to shine that out. Yeah, absolutely. So rascal for the San Francisco Shock, Mallory. Who is your watch house player? Uh, Kate called it out in the match. Um, it has to be the King of the Pirates, um, Luke from the Shanghai. Yeah, Dragons. yeah. I would like to sort of sh- have him share this with Koma as like an unstoppable support yeah, duo, and I'll tell you why. Luffy was getting sleeps that like nobody else could have gotten. He was absolutely killing it. He's the sleep mm-hmm. god, and he was popping off, and he deserved to. And then Koma does whatever he wants when he wants to go get a res. Somebody yes. will die. I- oh my him. gosh! Yes. <laughs> Oh my god. So when they were playing the Titans, and I forget who he was resing, but they died like right on that ledge on Volskaya on the second point to the right. And Paxel was right there as Diva just waiting and shooting. And Koma flew up to him and then looked Haskell in the eye and was like, try me. Got the res and then ran away. And every single time he got an incredible res last night, me and Kate were like, they can't keep letting him do this. Yeah. How are they letting him get away with this? He's so good. He does whatever he wants. It's incredible. I wish I could play uh, Mercy like that. Yeah. Ooh, so we've gotten some incredible ones so far. I, I have just labored over this decision for a while uh, because 
You have Ding, who gets 122,000 damage on Farah in the match, which is just like, what? Uh, very cool, Ding. Uh, then you have Gomsu, who like showed an unbelievable Wrecking Ball. In addition to all the other stuff he was doing, Like he would go in and, like, to no fault of Rascals, but he would force out that Immortality Field so fast on so many occasions because there was just so much pressure coming in. And then they allowed that to draw that out early in the fight, and it led to a lot of good snowballs from there. But uh, I have to go. I wrote a piece about him today. I have to go with Young Jin. Um, if you look at the Shanghai Dragons of stages one and two, this is C9 Young Jin on Dorado. This is Young Jin who was stuck on Brigitte, struggled like a lot of other DPS players on that hero. Uh, kind of like Jake, he would get caught out and far a little bit far, too far in the front line quite a bit. Um, just struggled on it. It was not in his nature to play that hero, just like so many other DPS players. And Shanghai has realized that, and this is a credit to their coaching staff as well, uh, and also to Houston's coaching staff for doing a similar thing with Jake. Uh, they have just allowed Young Jin to... They haven't built around him, but they've allowed him to do what he's best at, and that is this Doomfist Roadhog that is just unbelievable. And not only was he playing better, but he was playing with like this sick swagger. He was just stunning on people. He had no regard. Like, the 180 hook on Havana is a swagger confidence move. That's a bold play. And he made like some flanks on Doomfist that were very much in the same vein as well. But um, seeing a player who got so mocked and so shamed for the C9 to now have all this swagger and popping off on these heroes was just like a great redemption arc for me. So I got a lot of feels about Young Jin. Uh, the dude played like Reinhardt and Genji in the same like seven minutes on one map early in the season. And I fell in love with him at that point because I was just like, who is this guy? Uh, so, a big Young Jin fan, probably always will be, but he has to be, from a very biased perspective, my Watch House Player of the Week. Um, that, that being said, like we talked about, I mean, this was just an unbelievable series. Um, San Francisco were absolutely in this. We talked about in our pre-show meeting, Choi Hoban is an excellent candidate as well. Um, for as good as Young Jin was playing, Choi Hoban had the best of him on Roadhog quite a few times. Uh, and you have to credit uh, Choi for that performance. Um, and, you know, if if San Francisco doesn't field that different roster and they take map one, it could have been a totally different series. So there's there's a lot going into this that makes this a tough decision. So, um, yeah, any other for you guys, any other lasting impressions from that match? I know I, I want to make sure we fully talk about it before we go into our next segment, you know. I think for for the first map when Shanghai won, you know, you could feel it in the air. Even if you weren't live, even if you're at home, you could feel that something was about to happen that night. And you could see that San Francisco, because remember, they had just put that interview with Sinatra and Super on right before the match starts. And Sinatra was talking as much as he wanted, and he goes, watch us lose, ha, ha, ha. But I tweeted earlier that what was poetic about it was that I think at the end of stage two or like earlier at the beginning of stage three, uh, they actually had Sinatra and Super on Watch House. Not Watch House. They had a... a the preview yeah. show for Overwatch. Yeah. yeah, Watch Point. Yeah. And um, thank you, yeah. Watch Point. Um, and one of the things they said about teams that had a chance going through the rest of the stage, they had, like either go on the feed or to have a really solid record, like 6 1, they said it was Shanghai because the things they were doing in scrims yeah. were mind boggling. So you, if you factor in that piece that they said that Shanghai was doing completely nasty things in scrims and then couldn't put up the numbers and couldn't outperform them when it mattered. That's a story right there in itself. And then just I was just thinking about that the entire time, and it was just like completely just shutting down my brain. I couldn't even think. Yeah. Not properly. It was like a hype beast. No, seriously, yeah. I mean, that's that's very true. Mallory, do you have anything that just from the match, standout things, just kind of things you're thinking about? I mean, all of it was sort of like a three-and-a-half-hour panic attack. Yeah, it's very fair. <laughs> So That's very fair. I was feeling a lot of things. I think when they went into map seven, I, I picked up my, my can of alcohol and I cracked it open and I was like, it's time for this, I guess. Here we go. Um, overall, I mean, it's so interesting to think about what Shanghai is going to do going forward if Choo 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 is going to be a thing because they play a lot of triple DPS. Um, and Ding, just, it's, it's like it's hard yeah. to choose who you want to be on DPS because Ding does whatever he wants. Mm -hmm. I respect that about him. He let uh, he let out a lot of barrages directly into a matrix, and you know what? At some point, you just got to say he's doing what he yeah. can. Yeah. Diem is a Widowmaker god. Yeah. We saw his stats before the game started. He's number one in I think everything. 
yeah, it's one or maybe two in some things, but yeah, I mean. Yeah, I think he was yeah, like check on the yeah, right yeah. Now. yeah, I was about to say he did because they posted the whole graphic. I think he was tied with some with somebody in another one. Probably one. Carpe. <laughs> Probably Carpe, his <laughs> best Kidding. friend. Yeah. So it's, I'm really really happy for them. This is what they deserve. Yeah. I don't know what sort of comps they're going to do going forward, but I'm very interested to find out. I'll say that. Yeah. And maybe, just maybe, if they want to play two tanks, we can see Gagory again. Yeah. For the love of God. Man. Bring you her know, back on the stage. You know, funny that you bring up Gagory. If you look at the D.Va players in the league, and there's 24 of them, she's still ranked 13th, and she's only played 150 hours this entire season. Yeah. I mean, is so for her to play the bare minimum, because I think the minimum to get ranked in that top level is like 146 hours so sorry, 146 That's minutes cool. i think for her to even show yeah. up in the top top half or even the beginning of the bottom half having not played at all that tells you a lot about her play yeah i totally agree and and, and the fact that we're on this kind of this conversation leads us just ever so cleanly into our next segment so we're talking about how shanghai is going to handle um possibly having to play due to two dps and that is because um what we're looking at coming up and this was teased during the broadcast during the Shanghai and San Francisco match. Um, Achilles first said that the announcers had something up their sleeves for Thursday, and then Puckett and the gang were just clowning on the desk. And uh, there were some not so subtle hand gestures that lead us to believe that 222 is going to be announced Thursday. Oh, oh look at us doing the same thing. Uh, being announced Thursday on the Watchpoint uh, Stage 4 preview show, or whatever you're going to call it. So, with that in mind, it's been all but confirmed. We've had um, some Overwatch people on this show, Overwatch League people, uh, like John Galt and Trill, who have uh, said about all they can say to confirm it's going to happen without saying that Blizzard has confirmed it. So, uh, we are pretty sure at this point, uh, about as sure as you can be, that it's happening. So, to do that, we have to talk about the implications. This is going to massively change the layout of the season. Teams are going to be forced to... If you're not familiar with what 222 roll lock is, they're going to be forced to play two DPS, two healers, and two tanks. So we are going to go through uh, some teams that we believe are going to be the biggest winners out of this deal. We don't like to focus on the negatives here on Watch House. We're only going to focus on the winners. Who's winning? Whose stock is going up on this uh, from this this meta change? So um, Mallory, I think you've got the first one that you're going to kind of highlight for us. Who is the first winner in your mind um, of the 222 lock? Kate's going to like this hey. one because it's, it's the Philadelphia Fusion. Wow. Of course. You saw it a little bit in one of their games. Uh, I think it was their first game against Boston in Stage 3, where they were like, we've had enough. And EQO was like, Brig Jail? Not a thing anymore. Played Genji for the first time all season and absolutely destroyed everybody. Yeah. He hurt my feelings a lot that day, but it was worth it. Because we forget how good he is because he's been stuck in Brig Jail for so long. Like, EQL, they made it to the Grand Finals last year because their uh, damage players are so yeah. good. Carpe is right there. EQO is right there. Once, once they get unleashed and can do whatever they want again, oh man, these fools are going to be quaking. Yeah. Uh, this, ever so, this seems ever so similar to the Philadelphia Fusion of last year. It's like they're decent all season, a big meta change comes along, they catch the right end of it, and they start going off. Now Sato came in, and some other things changed too, but the point is, I think this kind of unlocks the fusion as well. Um, EQO is another player like Youngjin, like Jake, who's really struggled on Brigitte, I would say, um, throughout the season, and it's just not in his nature to play that hero, and I think he's going to be totally unlocked now. Um, I do think the fusion should be a little bit worried when it comes to depth, I think if they do struggle, it will be because of their depth. Uh, they just traded away Fraggy, their main tank, who has been on the bench all season, but is a, a good... I feel like he could have been a good option at different points in 2-2-2 coming up. Uh, maybe let Sato focus on Winston, Fraggy focus on Reinhardt, but who knows? Uh, it's not a possibility anymore anyway. So um, I agree, though, with you, Mauer. I think the Fusion benefit from this, absolutely. Um, Darren, any thoughts on Fusion? Uh, yeah, I think Fusion... Again, I think being unleashed and being allowed to play their style because they are a very scrappy team. I think they have the mechanical skill, like you said, in their damage players to be able to just go in and win scrappy fights that they shouldn't. We saw it all the way out the playoffs and every stage they were in last year, and we saw it through the grand finals last year. They they were taking people to task, and it's just because they left a DPS alive for too long. 
Carpe and Ikkyo cannot be allowed to stay alive, especially if Sato's running Winston. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and so just as a reminder, the, the Fusion are sitting at 12-9 and nine right now. They're at ninth overall in the standings, very much in the playoff race. So if this does serve to benefit them, we should expect the Fusion in the playoffs. Uh, I would think so. So, yeah. Um, another team that I would say we should definitely expect in the playoffs, uh, Darren, which team are you going to highlight for us next? Surprise, surprise, we're going to unleash the Dragons from Ooh. Shanghai. I think Shanghai Dragons are going to be elevated a bit throughout this 2-2-2 lock, and solely because, again, we we still have Dia, and we've got Youngjin and Ding, who just showed what they can do. We still have Dia kind of sitting in the wings, and secret weapon, we get to run Gegory mm -hmm. again, and we get to run the very aggressive, very uh, pressure-oriented Diva. and if she gets to run her Zarya, which she made her name for in the first place, I really think that we're going to see some, uh, some real... Uh, ups, like upsets because I still think even though they won stage 3 playoffs, Shanghai still needs to go through the rest of the next stage and just prove that they can solidify that, that momentum and just solidify their rank, yeah. but uh, I really think that they're going to soar to that top 5 spot. Yeah, I, I agree. I think I like what you say about um, Gagri going on the Zarya because I think they also, they also have Envy now, and you put Envy on D.Va and have them kind of rotate in those two roles, and you have a definite uh, stacked lineup and good depth at off-tank. Um, Shanghai is a team that can also rotate DPS. Um, they have an incredible, as we've already seen, uh, Far Widow, which is looking like it might be one of the metas uh, going into 2-2-2. But if they end up doing like a Sombra Doomfist, you've also got that if you bring in Youngjin um, or just any combination with you know a more uh, projectile kind of player like Youngjin is. So uh, I completely am on board with this as well. I think Shanghai is going to get much better. Mallory, any final thoughts on Shanghai before we move on to the next one? I agree, and I want to see them in the... Yeah, I think I think we will see good things from them. Um, I'm going to jump on our next one here. Um, so I'm going to say that the Houston Outlaws are going to be a winner of the 2-2-2 roll lock. Um, Houston clearly was not a fan early of the, uh, the GOATS era of Overwatch. It uh, didn't do them very good. Uh, so once they got away from that and kind of started crafting their own style, it worked out. Um, I think they'll continue to do that and very much use the similar roster they've been using um, going into 2-2-2. Their issue is going to be the DPS. Um, do they run Dante Linkser? Do they run Jake Dante, uh, Jake Linkser, Dante Jake? I mean, there's a lot of questions there. Uh, Arhan, does he play? You know, lol. Uh... And then what do you what do you do with the with your two tanks? I mean, you've got you know Muma is gonna play, um, but what do you do with Spree? What do you do with Cool Mat? Does Dante play some Diva like he has been occasionally? Um, and then obviously supports. You're probably looking still at uh, Boink and Rockus. So um, I think that you know Houston is sitting currently at eight and thirteen. Um, we were looking at some numbers last week for like how many wins you're gonna need to get into the season playoffs. It's looking like 14 is like, you're solid, you're safe. 13, there might be like two teams at 13 and map differential ends up kind of bumping someone out. So if they can go six and one, uh, they're probably in. That's a super tall task, but they've also got a very uh, winnable schedule. Them and the Valiant both have incredibly good schedules to close out. So um, I think Houston can and possibly will do that and uh, will benefit from the lock for sure. Um, anything else to add to the Houston case? Any disagreements? Any any other stuff? What do you guys think? I think Dante is a mad lad, and I think the more that they play him, and I'd also like to see more chilly Matthew. Yeah, he's yeah. a diva. I agree. And I think uh, I think Rockus. I think part of him, and between him and Muma, obviously they're going to be starting, but I think they need to just buckle down a little bit and just be a little bit more. Uh, Focused, I think sometimes that they their position is a little weird. They get picked off early, or they yeah. feed when they don't need to. And I think as long as the two of those can rein in and be like he's like a be that heartbeat of the team along with Jake, I think yeah, I think uh, Houston's uh, looking pretty good. Sweet, uh, Darren, I'll let you take the next one. Who is another one of our winners of the two to two lock? Sure. Um, sounds like I'm playing my favorite of today, but uh, the team that I actually write for at, at TGH is going to be uh, Atlanta Rain. I think they're going to I think they're going to soar. They're sitting in a pretty solid spot right now on stage play uh the standings. I think they're sitting at 9 and yep, 12. 
Um, and their schedule this stage is pretty winnable. I mean, they play Hangzhou and London, which are games that are good, they might have to struggle with, but I'm pretty sure they can make them at least competitive. And that helps their map differential because they're sitting at a dead even map differential right now. Um, they play Paris, Boston, and Washington, and I, I solidly think that they're going to dominate all three teams. And the teams that are going to give them the most trouble, the most control they have over their schedule is going to be Houston and Dallas. And both of those teams are going to give them a run for their money. Yeah. And those are the teams, made it pretty much everyone except for London and Hangzhou are below them in the standing. So if they can beat the teams below them, they'll go 5-2 and two at the minimum. Yeah. And they're in the play-in. Yeah, I, I, I like this call as well, Darren. Um, I think that um, I think Atlanta, the only thing that could be hard for them is DPS depth. I think uh, every other spot on the team is going to be fine. Um, I think Baby Bay, though, is incredibly mechanically skilled at hit scan, so I don't think they're going to have any problem with a Widowmaker beta, which I think is what's going to happen. Uh, Widowmaker, McCree, something yeah. hit scanning like that. Um, so I, I agree, and, and you know they've had they have maybe the top play of the year. What was it? I think Erster on uh, Tracer, the the six K on Eichenwald. I mean, that's yeah. still probably the top play of the year for me. Um, he's had some junk rap plays that I would say are contenders for that as well. So between those two, I think they can handle just about anything. But um, yeah, I agree. I think they'll do better than their nine and twelve spot they're at now in a two 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 world. So I would tend to agree. For sure, um, Mallory. If you don't have anything else on Atlanta, I will hand it over to you for the next team. Yes. The next team that I think is definitely going to be winner of a two luck would be Toronto Defiant. Mm. They started off really, really strong in stage one. I think they went to the stage one playoffs, yeah, so if too. I'm not mistaken. Yeah. They popped off. And then lately, I don't know what happened in stage two. They sort of floundered. And then stage three, they went 0 oh, 7. Mm -hmm. So the plot armor says that they will succeed <laughs> next season. I mean, next stage. The plot armor dictates yeah, that. But on top of that, during this, like, stage three madness, they signed two of, I, I think, some of the best DPS players in Mr. Logix and Mangachu, mm -hmm. my personal favorite professional Overwatch player. I'm very happy somebody finally picked yeah, up Mangachu. Yeah, about time. Got, it is about yeah. time. Thank you so much, yes. Connor. Uh, you know, and Mangachu, th their hero pools are so contrasting, so it, like, works, because Mr. Logix is a Widowmaker god, and a Tracer god, and he does very well, and then Mangachu can play Torbjorn, and you know what? Sometimes that's all you need. Sometimes huh. you just need Torbjorn. And with the, all the changes that they're making and, like, integrating, because they have gods now, too, he's been around for a little bit, I think all these new players that they've brought in and that they're going to be rotating in, and with this time off they've had with the playoffs, and then the like week break, week and a half break. I think they're gonna come back, they're gonna be stronger, and I really, really hope that they can sort of catapult themselves into a better position. Because their stage one I think has sort of helped them even it out a little yeah, bit yeah. in terms of their standings. But I don't know how possible it is for them to make it to the season playoffs, but it'd be nice to at least see them make a comeback. Yeah, we we talked about this last week and they would have to go seven and zero, it looks like. Um most likely. Uh which would be a tough ask. But potential, uh, I guess, you know, things really... Uh, 2 is on it's the Wild West, so we have no idea. Maybe they do it. Who knows, yeah. honestly. Um, yeah, I agree. I think they have, of all the teams we've talked about, have by far the most DPS depth. You have two Western DPS players that are pretty solid, uh, and then ones that you just talked about. We also have IM37 and Ivy, who were kind of leading things for them before this. They struggled a lot, but I think maybe in a more rotational, traditional 2 2, two system, they could have a lot more success. Um, as a team, they've just got a ton of depth in general. Um, they look like they're shifting towards a Western roster. That might continue to happen. We'll just have to kind of monitor them. But if they can find some identity to kind of close out the season, they could absolutely reasonably uh, improve, I think. Um, I'll close this out with our last one, and then we're going to talk about just a few other teams that might not necessarily be winners, but ones that we're just kind of confused about, maybe do one or two each. But um, I think the Washington Justice... Uh, for uh, some similar reasons as the Toronto Defiant, where you, you can only go one direction from the bottom. Uh, I think they are going to improve. Um, Corey has shown time and time again that he is a very capable DPS player. Um, Stratus, I believe, is a really good... 
He reminds me a lot of Youngjin. Is a really good Doomfist and just he's also hilarious. So I just want to root for him and just naturally. So uh, I hope he does well. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that Washington is going to be a team that looks good. Um, you know, you've also got uh, Otto. That's the other one I was forgetting. Otto, who's of course awesome. So uh, I think Washington should look better. I don't know that they're going to look incredible or maybe even not even end with a winning record at this stage, but they're going to, I would guess, uh, win as many games this stage as they've won all season. So um, I, th- I think that, that would be a great way to end things if you're a Washington fan. Um, they've got more announcements coming very soon. Uh, definitely keep an eye on their Twitter tomorrow. Uh, just word of the wise. Uh, I think they're going to continue to rebuild. They also just got um, the two guys from Envy, uh, Lilish and uh, Ellie, I think. Ellie Vote. The two. Ellie Yeah, the two former Angry Titans. Their, their tank line, basically, their front line. So um, similar to Toronto, they're doing like a Western rebuild, it looks like. So I could see good things happening from that. Uh, mixed rosters do well in the Overwatch League, it seems like. So um, you guys have any final thoughts on Washington before we jump to some other teams? I'm just excited to see them uh, make it work. I kind of like, I want to see Fozix pop off in support. Yeah. I just kind of, I've always, I've always liked this play. So I just, again, like you, I just want to see that team just play better and not feel like they look lost. I want them to just be confident out there and just give these teams a nice competitive game. I think they're going to win the first two games, though. Yeah. But they have Florida and Toronto. Yeah, they, that, those those, those will both be good games. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I do want to get to a few teams, though, that we could be. Um, I'm not going to say these are going to be the losers of the 2 2 2 because um, I just. One, we want to focus on positivity here on Watch House because that's what we're all about. But the other thing is we really just don't know. This is so much going to be the Wild West. We've never been... These players have never in their professional careers played in a meta that forces 2-2-2. These guys have been playing the game since possibly 2015, 2016. Have never played the game this way uh, where it is forced. So that has a lot of implications. And so we don't know who's going to win or lose until we see it happen. Um, There are teams we have questions about, though. One of the first teams I want to bring up, and uh, a lot of these are off the cuff, so excuse us if we're a little uh, kind of going wild here, but I think the Dallas Fuel are a team we have to talk about. Um, you have a lot of there. there this is a team that started so hot. Um, the trash talking was there. There was a lot of good things to like about this team, but they're, for a lot of different reasons lately, have been in the public eye. Um, Jane's recent post, him stepping away from social media is a really big thing. This isn't necessarily fuel-related, but um, it still is a big hit to the team. Um, I don't know how... I, I'm assuming He's going to still be doing his job, but I just think he's out of the public eye. Um, you've had players yeah. like Zachary just constantly under attack for his play um, for a lot of the same reasons that players like EQO, Jake, and Youngjin were. So it's kind of just his turn in the, the brig... Uh, I don't know getting ganged up on train. I don't know. That's really poorly worded. But for whatever reason, uh, the fuel have been really struggling lately. Um, OGs on the bench and stuff like that. So what do you guys think of the fuel going into stage four? Um, they are sitting at 10 and 11. So if they get four wins, they're probably in. But a four and three stage for them after last stage kind of looks like a tough ask. Uh, what do you guys think about the fuel going into stage four? Sorry, this is a tough one to start with, but... Yeah, because it's not like... Because their schedule, their schedule this, this stage isn't isn't terribly easy. It's not terribly yeah, difficult. It's... They have a nice mix of teams, and sometimes I feel like they play to the caliber of their opponent, which is probably the only downfall I see with this crew, because on paper, they're great. I, I love this team on paper. When they're doing well, Dallas is really fun to watch. They do awesome comps, uh... Their team wipes are nice. They're one of those spawn camp teams, but when they're struggling, it, it it's it's really difficult to watch. And I think if they can find the identity that they want to have and just stick to it, I I think they can find a way to at least go four and three at the minimum. Yeah. What about you, Mallory? What do you think? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, they have my boy Node, mm. so yeah. Part of me, I really want to see them succeed because that's my boy. Yeah. But I don't know. The last couple times I've managed to watch a Dallas game, it's been sad. Yeah. And I, I don't know. 
they were kind of doing what Boston was doing when they were playing like musical support players. Mm. And it's like, I don't know if you're trying to figure out which teams, like which people fit the best, if you're going to try to practice for this sort of meta. Yeah. But I don't know. They, they look a little shaky, maybe worse for wear. And I bet that their coach, you know, going through what he's going through isn't really helping. Yeah, it's going to be hard. Fortunately, so I don't know. I think for them, it's just going to be something that you have to see before you really know what's going to yeah, happen. That's... We're probably just going to have to see a game first, and then we'll be like, oh. Okay. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, I, get to, I, get, I agree with that. Yeah, I think, I mean, it seems like, I think what I've heard is the teams have known about this role lock since maybe like end of stage two-ish. So they've they've known about it through all stage three. Had time to prepare. So you could you could credit you could you could uh, think of Dallas's struggles in one of two ways. You could think of it as well. They knew two 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 was coming. Uh, took a lot of this stage to maybe not focus one hundred percent on stage three, but until look ahead to the you know stage four and the playoffs, what meta that's going to be played on, and let themselves fall into that one and six spot. Kind of not intentionally, but were willing to make that sacrifice to be better equipped for two two two. That's one case. The other case is they really are just having some internal issues and struggling, and there are some more serious things going on there, and that's going to carry over into 2-2-2. Mallory, you're exactly right, though. It's going to take a game to be able to pinpoint, even more several games to be able to pinpoint what, it, what which one of those two it is or if it's some combination of the two or something like that. So Dallas is one of the most complicated things, teams to look at. I personally don't think they're going to make the playoffs. Uh, that's me being harsh and uh, stuff, but... Not everyone can make it, so that's just kind of how it is. But um, let's look at some other teams. Um, I want to talk about these two teams in tandem because I think we're going to have a lot of the same talking points. But I want to talk about New York and San Francisco. Um, what do you guys make of teams like these that have, like, I don't know, 10,000 DPS players on their bench just, like, waiting? <laughs> uh, what, are, what are those teams? Are those going to be better teams, or is there going to be too many chefs in the kitchen? Like, what's it going to be like for those two teams? Uh, I think for New York specifically that you're going to be able to specialize for map and map tight. Um, we'll probably be able to get to see a lot more Pine on control maps, especially busting out the McCream on uh, Ilios. Uh, Sabiovi is back, thank Gosh. the gods. And it's just I just really think that, you know, for a team, like again, like what, they have nine players on the roster I think they have, something like that. Four of them or five of them are DPS, yeah. something crazy. Yeah. They have 10 million people on the team that can they click heads. Five DPS, so. uh, I, I don't think they're going to have to lean their playstyle and their resources into Jonak as much, which actually makes it scarier because they're unleashing the guns that they have sitting in the back stockpiled for, for this entire past few months we've had of this season. Yeah. Um, as far as San Francisco, we remember what they were like last season, and I don't want to hold that against them, but I think they had a situation where it was like too many mm -hmm. cooks. So I think they're going to have to kind of find a direction and just go from there. Uh, th that's just my take on those two yeah. teams. I, I wonder to what degree, like, we've, we've heard this said from, I think, Taimu tweeted about it at one point, where he said, like, there's nothing worse than thinking you can do something for your team and not being able to play, like just being stuck on the bench. And Sabiobi said, like, I almost walked away from the game at one point. Like, he had a, they, the Overwatch League put out a really good video piece about Sabiobi where he talked about going through being on the bench. So you wonder with both of these teams... You have so many star players on those teams just sitting on the bench. I would call Pine a star player. I would call Sabiobi a star player. I would, I would. I'm not quite there with Flower yet, but he's close. He's very good. Uh, I would call Striker an architect, both on the um, Striker certainly, but architect on the cusp of being star players, and they're not playing. Yeah. I mean, Striker and architect played one map and the just kind of got thrown in there. But um, so I don't like. To what degree are these players going to want to play? You know, like when what breaks the back for him? Uh, so I, that's my biggest question with those two teams. I think they're going to be fine. You certainly have options to where you could just tell, like Striker, only play Tracer. If we play Tracer, you're going in. Uh, say Biobi, same thing. Uh, Architect, if you're we're, we're playing Widow, you're going in, and be able to specialize that specifically. Uh, I don't think that would make the quality of the life of the players very high, but you could certainly do it and have some more mastery. I don't know, you know. I'm not a coach in the Overwatch League. I don't know. Mallory, what do you think? Yeah, that's a that, that that's a conversation I had last night when I was thinking about it. Because, like in a two two two, will they play striker? Or will they play Sinatra? Because Sinatra also plays a really good tracer, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. Like that's why yeah. he was doing what he was doing. So if they want to do tracer, 
Well, they play Sinatra or Stryker. I don't know. Maybe Sinatra. If they want to do Widowmaker, it's going to have to be Stryker because I don't think Sinatra plays uh, Widowmaker to the same level as Stryker because Stryker was really good at Widow yeah. last year. He definitely wasn't he wasn't Carpe and he wasn't Prophet, but he held his yeah. own. And he made it pretty far in the Widow 1v1, which everyone was surprised at. So yeah. I think if they want to go more towards Farrah uh, Widow, like you had mentioned earlier, mm-hmm. if that's sort of one of the metas we're going to be seeing, we might be seeing Stryker more often and Sinatra could be benched. Mm-hmm. You know, we don't know how that's going to go yeah. down. Um, and then, you know, there's Rascal. Exactly. And R- Rascal is, like, Sombra's number one fan. Yeah. So if they want to do more Sombra stuff, they're going to have to put Rascal in. And it's just, like, literally, yeah. I said musical court players earlier, but now I'm going to say musical DPS players. It's like, <laughs> who plays what? You play this, you're going in. You play this, you're going yeah. in. And so I wonder with those teams, like, will it affect Team Synergy? That's kind of one of the cores. The desk talks about it a lot, like how you need a core six for synergy and communication, just familiarity. Will that be a factor? Um, like we, we saw it happen with, um, it was with Choi and uh, Architect maybe, where they had the halt hook. No, it was a Smurf and Choi. That's what that's what it was. That's why they, they were saying one of the perks of having Smurf in is they can both speak Korean and call out halt hooks more. Uh, like I, That's a real thing for these teams, and so it'll be very interesting to see what the effects of that is in higher numbered DPS teams like those two. Um, in the end, though, like you said, I think both are locked into the playoffs. Like they're both making it. They're good. But um, we could definitely see those two teams have worse stages than they have been having. I would think that's a possibility. Um, I don't know, but it's certainly interesting. Um, since we're at the top of the bracket, we'll, we'll take a couple more of these teams and we'll, we'll, we'll dip out for the night. Um, we, we talked about Vancouver pre-show some. Uh, Darren, I know you had some thoughts about this. What are we? Should we be worried about the Vancouver Titans, or are they good? I wouldn't be worried about them. I don't think they're going to suddenly drop and go like below five hundred mm-hmm. or anything. But I think they're. I think the the prestige behind the brand is not going to be as impactful to the teams that they're going to go up against. Because again, we haven't really seen what they're. Well, if you don't count that game on Horizon Lunar Call, anyway, they ran quad yeah. DPS bumper and jump and all that <laughs> stuff, but. Uh, if you don't take that kind of silliness into consideration, there is still a solid team, yeah. right? Don't get it wrong. But I think a lot of these other teams were hindered by the fact that they had star power DPS players that couldn't play. So they had to really find a way to work inside the GOATS meta, and it's more teamwork, teamwork oriented. I don't know if Vancouver can play the same style with Bumper being the way he is if they don't have all those extra resources to pour into yeah. him. If people are allowed to get deleted with one shots from across the map, especially like if they're playing Nambani, I'm expecting probably Ash for Kree to be played a lot on that map okay. also. We don't get into a lot of the hack fist far uh sniper stuff, but I I, I think that their their identity is gonna have to change and their style is gonna change. I think they're still gonna be aggressive because you can't change that. Yeah. But I think the way in which they uh take space is gonna have to completely be a one eighty for them to be competent against a lot of these uh these these killers. Yeah, I agree. And this is where, you know, uh, we reported Shy Guy on the site reported that Tizzy has been signed by them. Uh, it's reported that he went back to Korea to get his get some visa stuff worked out and he'll be coming back. But uh, with Tizzy joining the roster, I don't know if he's going to be able to start necessarily for Stage 4. I'm not sure what the timeline is for his expected start date. But that could be what they're worried about is a lot of bumpers, uh, the way he plays – they could want another option at main tank. It's 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 telling that that's the first player they signed. This is kind of a core roster, and so who was the first backup they were going to bring in? And it's main tank. So I don't know if it necessarily says they're not confident in bumper, but it definitely says they might want another option. So that's something to keep an eye on for sure. Um, yeah, I agree. I think they'll... I don't know that they are going to, like you said, dip super low, but... They've already been just looked like a different team than they were early in the season lately. Um, I mean, losing 4-1 to anyone was be out of the question for them early on. So uh, definitely an interesting team to keep an eye on. Um, let's see here. I don't know. The only other team I, w- I could kind of see us talking about a little bit um, would be Guangzhou. Um, this I love talking about these bubble teams because I'm just a big fan of, like, who's making the playoffs, who's not. I love that conversation. So sorry if I'm being biased towards these teams. Uh, But Guangzhou is fascinating. Uh, This is a team packed with DPS. They just make a move to get 
uh, reported by Halo at least. It hasn't been confirmed by them yet, but to get Bishu from the Gladiators and to get Fraggy from the uh, Fusion. You've also got Nero, you've got Kib, you've got Happy, and you've got Eileen. Four very capable DPS. Sorry. Kib was going that's to... Right, that's right, that's right, that's right. Yes, there is a player leaving. That's true. So, they have three of those players. <laughs> they have some DPS players. I was just like reading names and I was like, that does sound wrong. Um, but this is a team that is going through some, like we've talked about with some other teams like Toronto and Washington, some identity, not issues, but they're trying to figure out who they are still. Um, these two additions further confuse that for me, honestly. But um, what do you guys think yeah. of Guangzhou? I think that, that Bish was probably a good idea. Because then Hotbug can play DPS. Yeah. Hotbug's good at DPS, so he doesn't have to flex on to, to Diva and, you know, try to do whatever. He's a good Diva, but Bishu is also a really good yeah. Diva, who's, like, specialized in Diva. And then Hotbug can play, like, Tracer. He can play Pharah, which we've true. seen him play a couple times before, and absolutely pop off. Like, Hotbug's really good. So I think Bishu is a really smart move for them so they can let Hotbug do Hotbug things. Um, Fraggy, I'm just happy to see, man. If we get to see Fraggy back on that stage, I mean, I guess it's all that matters, right? All He's matters. been freed. Give him to us. Yeah. I don't even know if Fraggy exists. He might be on an island somewhere. Uh, this might all just be an elaborate cover-up. We haven't seen Fraggy, even in Fusion content, to my knowledge. I'm not an avid Fusion fan. No, I haven't seen him anywhere. He's just, like, disappeared. He's just collecting the check, working on, you know, support, help the team, Thanks. waiting for his time to play. He's just chilling. Yeah. He's probably grinding at work really hard, but, like, it's... I haven't seen him anywhere either. He's just... In a cave playing ranked on an alt account. <laughs> yeah. uh, honestly. Uh, but yeah, I, this is a team that I wrestle with a lot when I think of season playoffs, going back to that conversation. Um, if they are a winner in the 2 2 2 kind of lottery of who's going to do well, uh, they have a chance. They're at the 9 and 12 spot that so many other teams are at. Uh, they can win four to five games and get in. Um, but will they is a tough question. Um, they're currently at 12, so I mean, they're. They are, you know, they're right there. They're close. Um, but, you know, in a DPS rotation world, we've talked about some of those other teams, they have a good rotation now. They have good rotation at nearly any position. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how they pan out. Um, any, oh, go ahead. Darren, are you going to say something? Oh, I was oh sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, if there are no other, do you guys have any other teams you want to make any last points on before we move on? I don't want to leave off any uh, Oh, one more thing. Sorry, I forgot to bring yes. it up. What happens to Chengdu? That's very interesting. I was going to bring him up too. What do you think? Because we can't, we can't run the ball triple DPS. And yeah, we can just run 2-2-2 two, two, two with that. But that's kind of their shtick. We should just like... You know what? I'm going to start a petition tomorrow that Chengdu is going to be exempt <laughs> from Lock 2-2-2. Two, two, two. I and, like that a lot. And just amen, and we just let it yes. go. That's it. I would love that. I mean, they're they're more entertaining than what they're probably going to be on two 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 right now, anyway. So might as well. Yeah, that. they're like, oh, everyone's running goats. No problem. Not doing that yeah. at all. See you guys <laughs> later. They get an exemption from meta because they didn't play the meta all season. They get an exemption. Right. They get yes. the buy and they get the plot yeah, armor. Exactly. It's a passive. They, they do what they want, and then you know what? We have to support. We them. have to. We have no option. No, I. I mean, I think. <laughs> I think a Mang and Elsa could be a good tank line. A Mang has shown he's looking a lot better. They do have um, the other tanks as well who can, I think, fill in with some more traditional styles of play if they need to. Uh, they have their full team together now, so, I mean, that's a good thing. Um, I don't know. I, I agree that this is tough. They're definitely stacked at DPS. They're kind of like the Dragons. Like, they've got, a, yeah. they've got three solid DPS players. Which, with all kind of similar... I'm thinking about it. They're actually very similar to the Dragons because... Uh, uh, Yang Zhao Long is very similar to Diem. I wouldn't, and maybe not apples to apples there, but Jinbu is very similar to Ding, and Bacon Jacks very similar to Young Jin, and that they do wacky things. Uh -huh. So yeah, that's funny, but I don't know. It's I honestly I'm so baffled and confused with what to say about Chengdu. I'm just talking to fill space. If I'm being <laughs> honest. Uh, Mallory, it, good. As I said. Do you need me to rant about London? Because I can rant please about rant London. Please rant about London. Oh, please rant about I would about love to hear this. Oh, Aces Honk incoming, Oh, now he's ranting. Spam Aces Honk in chat, please. Get some Aces Honk in here. Here's the tea. 
I said it before and I'm gonna say it again, and I don't care if I look like a fool after I say this. The deal is, I don't know what London wants to do 100% of the time. Because sometimes they play like, oh, maybe they did win last year. Maybe I didn't think that was all a dream. I didn't hallucinate that. And then sometimes they're, they got the clown shoes on, they're squeaking onto the stage, and then they just <laughs> fall apart. <laughs> so the issue that I have oh my God. I don't know. I feel like they are two different teams, but they're one team. And that's a problem. Because you don't know who's going to show up that day. And like, I remember last year, too, London literally just, like, cut almost everybody off their team and kept the six people. And they are like, we're going to play with these six people, and that's going to be it. And I was like, all right, that's a bold choice. But then they won. So I'm like, maybe it's not. <laughs> and Connor had to remind me, because I completely forgot that they had Prophet, who's good at this game. And I was like, all right, maybe in a 2-2-2, they can succeed, because Prophet's pretty good at this yeah. game. Guard's pretty good at this game when he gets to play Sombra. But overall, I just, I don't see it happening. I don't understand. I, I don't think they're going to make it to the season playoffs. And if they do, you're going to see me angry tweeting about it. Oh. And that's all I can say yeah. about that. I mean, they, they kind of surprised everyone winning last year in the first place. They're going through the playoffs at the end of the year. And everyone's like, wow, London is really, London's good? Yeah. What? What's happening? How is London beating everyone? What? What? Is this the same London Spitfire? They're a team that's 14th ranked right now in the league, and half the teams, half the teams in the league, are worried about them, and the other half are just like, "Do they know what they're doing? Yeah. How do you game plan for a team that doesn't know what they're going to do when they show up every day?" Yeah, that's very true. Got to ask Silosa or something. I don't know. Yeah, no, I totally agree. So, I can't add anything else to that. Aces honk is all I can really say. My expert analysis. So, <laughs> that's there you go. Uh, Kate and chat brought up Paris. Um, I think that Paris is an interesting team. I won't riff on this too long. I'll just say this really quick. I think we talked about this last week, but I think going into the season, we thought Paris would be these goats gods because they're from EU and that just inherently makes you good at goats. That didn't prove to be the case. It almost looks like now that they're going to be a better DPS team than they were a goats team. So if you are a Paris fan, I would have some hope. I think they're actually going to be better. Um, I just don't know that they have enough to really make a convincing finish to the season. Um, but I could be wrong. Soon and Shadowburn, uh, pretty good players, as it turns out. So uh, it's actually the rest of the team that I'm worried about on Paris. Uh, it's not the DPS, which I never would thought I would have said that about this EU Paris kind of culture of tank heavy, support heavy lineups. So uh, yeah, it's a weird world we live in. Um, we've riffed long enough. It's time to get this episode closed out. Uh, one thing we do each episode of the recap show is we drop our Watch House Words of Wisdom. Uh, what we've been calling this lately is basically just open mic night at the bar. Uh, you can go up there and say something very philosophical, like a Confucius says kind of quote. Uh, you can say something very inspirational, uh, if you want to. Something to look out for of yours. It's literally anything. It's you've got the mic for a couple minutes or so, or ten seconds. Do with it as you please. So, um... I'm gonna uh, Mallory. Uh, Darren knows gonna so Mallory. Uh, what do you have for us for your words of wisdom? First of all, Ace is hot. Of course, a <laughs> given. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, second of all, um, watch contenders oh, yes. always. Um, you always gotta watch contenders. Um, watch House Queens every other Wednesday now on this exact channel, uh, Game House on Twitch. Uh, we're every other week now. And I don't know. I, I say this a lot, and I'm just going to say it again. Be nice to people, because being nice is fun. And being mean is not fun. So just be nice. How about that? That sounds easy enough to me. I was, that leads, I'm going to, I'll go next. That leads very much into what I was going to say. Um... So this week we had what I would consider an actual tragedy in the league. So Jane is, of all the individuals out there that I've ever met in the scene, I've I met him in person but it wasn't a super meaningful interaction, but that I've like interacted with. He is by far the one that's had the most impact just himself on the entire scene as a whole. I mean, taking his own income, starting ELO Hell, and developing this culture around T2 Overwatch uh, that you know develops it, gives it support, all this stuff. He's brought in like casters and producers into that space to give the scene a more 
uh, high production, high quality feel, just to make the players like you know more empowered and help support them in their journey. So he truly does care about the scene. And the reason he's putting himself out there on social media so much because he wants to be involved in it. He wants conversations to happen. He wants these things to happen, X, Y, Z. So I certainly disagree with Jane on a few things. I think anyone disagree with anyone if they really get down to certain things. So uh, I love the guy. I love a lot of people in the scene. I really hope he gets well. Uh, this is what Mallory said. Just be nice to people. I mean, if you're getting on the internet just to be mean to someone, I think you need to self-examine quite a bit on some deeper issues that might be going on. So... Uh, reading his twit longer, which is on his Twitter. Uh, if you haven't had a chance, definitely go read it. And watching the videos he attached to it were pretty impactful. And um, I hope will change the way people approach their keyboards when they sit down uh, to spam on Reddit on someone's article or video or something. So, uh, and Mallory said it really well. Just be nice. It's a lot easier than being mean. So, that's my long-winded version of what Mallory said. Darren, I will let you close this out for your word of wisdom. Uh, we talk a lot about these teams and their impact, and we talk about clan fiestas and who's this, but just remember, to kind of parody and piggyback on what you guys are saying, uh, these are people. They're players on teams, they're professionals, they're doing what they can for the best of their organizations and the best of their ability, given the tools that they have and constraints by rules and whatever else is going on, but just like everyone watching and everyone around, they're human. So if you treat every person like the way you would hope to be treated when you're going through something and if you assume that everyone you meet online especially in the ranked letter because they know who you are is going through something it'd be a lot better that said be good to everyone in the ladder don't throw pick torb hammer kills always okay that that i think we're good um i don't want to say anything more because i want to end on that note uh thank you to again both of you guys this was a really fun episode uh as it is every week uh darren thank you so much for coming on we'll, we'll have you on more for sure it's been a blast yeah. Mallory, thank you so much for being on as always. Uh, definitely go tune in to House Queens on Wednesdays, preview show on Thursdays. We've got a lot of shows here on the TGH Twitch. Go check them all out. A lot of good stuff. Watch the Watch House, Watch Point preview show on Thursday as well. Get to promote another thing. Uh, because we got to see if, what the announcement is. It's going to be huge. Um, but yeah, again, thank you so much for everyone for tuning in. You guys are awesome. Um, from our house to yours, you guys have a good night. We'll see you on the other side. Peace.